I think this is a tail. And he's like, nope, that's not a tail. That's a vine. Or it's just like. <laughs> oh, a vine. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to. I knew you. <laughs> Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley. And today on the show, we again have my friend Lucas Harger, who is an editor, an Emmy award winning editor. He's done all kinds of things from massive commercial work to documentary features to short films like my short film, Ballistic. We collaborated together on Ballistic a year ago, and I had him on then to talk about that. But today I wanted to dive into his documentary work because that is such a different world for editors. And it's a very interesting world that I personally don't know a ton about. So I was very interested to get him on the show and sort of pick his brain about all of that and what sort of lessons and takeaways you can get from that sort of work when going to narrative work. So we're going to get into all that. So I'm going to shut up and jump right into it now with Lucas. So the first time we had you on, we were talking about mostly like ballistic and narrative yeah. editing work. This time I wanted to talk about what it seems like you do even more of right now, which you could correct me if I'm wrong, which is like a lot of doc work. Yeah, no, I do a lot of doc work for a couple few different directors slash producers or production companies. But yeah, I mean, it's a lot of doc work recently, which I like, especially having a good balance of like narrative and doc and commercial is kind of fun. But yeah, recently it's been kind of skewed towards doc. I mean, I can just get in. I mean, the reality is, is I think you can pick up and shoot a doc like yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 All you need is an interesting subject. Yeah, totally. And then you find the story in it, but more so you find the story in the edit uh, rather than production a lot of times. And so it's just like a longer timeline between narrative projects because I don't just want to cut narrative for anybody. I mean, unless there's a great story and a great director that I know I'll get along with, but like, yeah. you know, cutting for you or cutting for Booth. I mean, like these established relationships that I have and it just takes a while to get films off the ground and to get stuff funded to write the script concept, all of the things that goes into it. Then it hits the edit and you're in the edit for eight months, but it could have taken three years to get to that point. So then when I'm done with a film with you, I mean, it could be another one, two, three, four years, right? Yeah. Whereas docs just kind of seem to roll in. Yeah. And I I, I kind of just wanted to dive into the difference between narrative and doc, because I think that's pretty interesting, like uh, how much we've been talking about it offline and, and what you've been saying about it. I think it's really interesting how much different cutting something narrative versus, you know, this doc work is. What, one thing, you know, finding the story in the edit, like you're talking talking about is there a lot of reshoots with a doc like as you're finding the story do you start coming up with a shot list mm -hmm. of hey we need this and we need that to fill in these gaps because you find you know that yeah that through line i suppose while you're editing yeah for sure i mean there's definitely depending on the scope this and the size and honestly the runtime of the doc like for feature work there tends to be like a fair bit of reshoots and it's really good when i'm brought in like as early as possible on a doc because I can speak into it and like speak to what I need to make the story work. Um, there was one doc, I'm still working on it now. It's about like modern day cowboys. And they basically brought me on to the doc after they had done maybe 75 to 80% of the shooting, but I was able to speak in. I watched all the footage and was able to speak into the last like 10 days of shooting. And we got a lot of things that were really important to the narrative structure. And so... But you do have the ability to speak in and say, hey, we need a reshoot or we need to go pick up this or we need great establishing shots of this. And then sometimes, honestly, the story is still going when you're in the edit and you're like, oh, shit, this is happening. We need to go shoot it. This could be our closer. Like what this character is going through right now in their real life could be the thing to end it because nobody's life has a beginning, middle and end yeah. to whatever subject you're shooting. And there's definitely been times where it's like, this is the film we think we have. All of a sudden you hear the character is doing this. You go shoot it. And it kind of resets how you're thinking about the the process and the story. And so is that somewhat common or is that a pretty rare thing to happen? I mean, it's it's like pretty common for doc work to very dramatically blur the line between production and post-production. I mean, that stuff is like happening in tandem a lot of the time. Here's the last shoot we did. Check it out. See how it's working. Plugging it in. Hey, next time when you're with a subject, maybe try and steer it this way. Um, maybe yada yada things like that and so the production and post is not delineated at all 
So when you're getting into the doc, how, how early are you brought in? Have they already been shooting uh, with whatever the subject is and they have all this footage and then they bring you in? Like, have they finished? Have they wrapped shooting and then they bring you in and then, then there might be more? Or are you brought in at the beginning? It depends on, I mean, it depends on the project, depends on the budget, depends on a lot of different things. Um, I would love to be brought in early and like part of the concepting, part of the vision and the tone. Like if, if we can set the tone before shooting, principal shooting even happens, that's amazing. I mean, more times than not, I'm brought in 50% to 75% of the way through like the principal documentary shooting, the capturing, the big chunk of it. I'm usually brought in 50 to 75% of the way through that. And that still gives me a little bit of room to speak into the process and to speak into production, which is super helpful, but it can vary greatly. I mean, especially with established relationships, they're like, hey, we're thinking about doing a doc on this subject. What gets you excited about that? And so- That's it. That's yeah. really interesting. And, and what, like, like that's gotta be just- all the footage when they come to you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. How many hours of footage is like normal to be plopped in your lap? Um, I mean, like 200 hours, like for a feature, <laughs> it could be more depending on the length of the shoe and the subject matter and all of these things. But I mean, 200 hours, 175, 225 hours, something like that is like, okay, this is a decent amount of footage. Like we can start putting something together, you know? And so what, once you get all that footage is like just square one, first thing to do is sit down and just watch all 200 hours or like, what do you, how yeah, do you, man. How do you yeah, catalog yeah. all that? It, I, mm, 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 you do watch it. Like you have to watch it. That's your job. And especially in doc work, I mean, everything kind of lands on the editor's desk and the story a lot of times is crafted in the edit and the editor's role or at least position within the doc world tends to be quite a bit more director like. And so you have to watch all of the footage and you have to catalog everything and you have to understand what's there. You have to understand the story beats and you have to write the script, whether that's literally writing a script or I do a lot of note cards, pace, flow, rhythm, tone, vibe, direction, all of that kind of comes together in the edit. And so like once the footage hits my desk, get it into the NLE and then just start watching. And I just watch from day one to day 30 or, or however long they shot. And then, I mean, personally, I just start breaking it out into different bins. Like here they are at a restaurant, restaurant, the date, throw it in that bin and just start breaking it into these smaller chunks that I can kind of reference as I go. So it's a lot of footage though, but it's fun. I mean, I'm the only one that has presumably seen all of this footage. I mean, they shot it, but they could have two cameras rolling. And so no one person has seen all the footage. And so it all is kind of coming onto my desk and then I'm responsible to know what's there. Yeah. So how are you finding the story? Once you have all the footage, you've cataloged everything. Are you just, while you're watching it, are you usually finding what that thing is about? Like what you can sink your teeth into and sort of, you know, hang the narrative hat on. Yeah. Do you usually find that while watching and you're like, oh, there it is? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'll have hopefully had several conversations with the director or directors, just kind of their vision, their dream, their super high level concepts for, you know, things even like, why did this subject or this character intrigue you enough to spend a year, two years, three years of your life following them around, you know? And so hopefully I'll have gotten to the heart of the director. And so I kind of have somewhat of a foundation, even emotionally, somewhat of a foundation that I can start to build upon. And so then as I'm digging through the footage, you have to put yourself, I mean, it's a really privileged position to be in as the editor because I'm the first audience that's seeing this stuff come upon a screen. So you have to be really emotionally tuned in to what you're watching and the emotion and the vibe and the tone that it gives you on that first watch, you're essentially just repackaging it and giving it to the audience in a condensed version, but hopefully no less powerful. And so I'm grabbing as I'm cataloging and like putting things in bins and organizing how I like, I'm also grabbing bits that are really inspiring or like really interesting or really emotional. And I'll just tag it as just like pulls or selects for this moment, just so I have them in some other bin and in my head in some other way. And so as I'm going through the footage, I'm grabbing these things that are emotionally impacting me. I'm taking notes about how I'm feeling 
feeling when I'm watching this. Because after you watch it two, three, four, five hundred times, the emotional impact lessens. And so you have to refer back to how I felt the first time I saw this happen. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then are you thinking in any kind of a traditional story structure? Like, are you thinking in any kind of like a three act structure or, you know, certain moments that you want to hit certain beats or a third act turn or? Yeah, no, I mean, it really depends on your the story that you're cutting. But when I'm digging into the footage to like start to craft a doc, I'm not thinking in three act structure or any sort of meaningful structure or established structure at all. I'm just whatever this film needs, because honestly, I feel like my job is to just discover the film within documentary. I like to think of, especially doc versus narrative, with documentary work, you start with this huge block of clay or this huge block and you're just like chiseling away. You're like Dr. Grant discovering the velociraptor. Like you're slowly like, let's see where this bone goes. And you like try and follow it and you are just following these threads. You're pulling the threads. So for documentary, you start with this huge thing and then you whittle down to the film, down to the core idea, the core emotion. Whereas I feel like narrative work, you start with the core emotion, you start with the core idea and then you build out. It's like an inverted pyramid. And so, So starting wide and then slowly, slowly going down. And so whatever the film wants to be, whatever the film is telling me it wants to be is kind of what I chase. And then, of course, you get to the end and you take a step back and you're like, oh, wow, that's a three act structure, you know, but I never go into it with this kind of preconceived notion or this pre-existing idea of the structure that this film needs to be is X, Y and Z. I'll start to develop some narrative concepts and some narrative structure elements that are working for me in the moment that I can hang my hat on. But a lot of those things I don't ever expect to make it through to the end audience. It's more of like how this feels. But again, I mean, honestly, like you get it all on there and then you step back. And I don't know if it's just like looking back and prescribing the three act structure but every it starts to seem to fit into that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, a, I always talk about, I, I do hate talking about the three act structure by saying the three acts. I, I usually just like to say beginning, middle and end only because yeah. people get their backs up when you say structure, right. three acts, you know, yeah, when it's totally. like, yeah, everything has a beginning, middle and end. There's no yeah. a beginning and then it stops. There's also a middle and there's also an end. Yeah. So I always think of it in those terms. So, I mean, it does make a lot of sense. And of course you're going to have that, you know, introduction, then the bulk of the life of whatever it is. And then it's, it's conclusion. Mm-hmm. So that, that does actually make a lot of sense, but I, I'm just, I'm sort of like, cause I've never done, I mean, I did like, you know, very small vignettes earlier on in my career, but we're talking like five minute pieces. Yeah, yeah, And there yeah, was yeah. a definitive, like, this is what we're setting out to do. We're capturing exactly this. We have like two days mm-hmm. to shoot. So it wasn't this, like, we're shooting for this massive period of time. We have all this footage that we've even forgot things that we shot. It wasn't anything like that. So yeah, no, totally. It's so unique and interesting to me, this idea of, you know, concocting a story of, I mean, I mean I, I'm positive there was the idea of what the story might be going in, mm-hmm. but like, mm-hmm. Life isn't really a predictable thing. Yeah. So life happens during the course of, of filming. So then, like you said, you have all this footage and now you are writing after you're done shooting, which is yep. just fascinating to me. Yeah. So it's, I'm just so curious about like hearing more of how that process goes in the beginning, like maybe with a film that's already out that we could check out or something like how you found the end. Like what was the first thing that you found that where you're like... That's it. And then, you know, cause like yeah. when I'm writing, there's like, okay. So like when I'm writing a script or, or, you know, I'm developing a few things right now, like which you know of, mm-hmm. and it's like, at first there's this concept where it's like, oh, that's a cool concept. This happens. That's unique. That's exciting. But I, you know, I kind of don't care yet. I'm just like, oh, that's cool. There's something there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess I could make this. This is a cool idea. And oh, this character. And yeah, I'm a little yeah. more excited. Cause I'm like, oh, that's a, that's kind of a, that's a cool character to put in that circumstance. And, and these are some set pieces pieces that would be fun and whatever. And it's like, yeah, that's cool. It's an action sort of thing. That's cool. But it's not until the theme and the emotional arc of the character reveals itself to me, especially recently, like with these longer form, with short films, that's a different yeah. story altogether. But with these long format things, it's not until those two things really reveal themselves to me that I get really excited and the whole story starts to make so much sense. And it's like, mm-hmm. well, it has to end this way now, of course, because this is finally like you get that clarity of 
this is what we're saying with this. Yeah. So is that sort of the thing that you find a doc or is it totally different? Like, can you relate to that at all? Is what I'm saying. I'm trying to find like crossover between the two for some no, reason. Yeah. No, no, no. You, yeah. You have to look for that emotional heartbeat and that emotional in to the film. And as soon as you establish that emotional in or that character, or this is the defining moment of this film or the defining emotion of the film then you like chase that thread down and you just start pulling it and seeing where it goes and you just start putting stuff on the timeline and you know it could take a long time to find that like with this cowboy doc i mean it i worked on it for probably four or five weeks just going through footage cutting things trying things out developing ideas doing all this stuff four or five weeks just kind of like trying to figure things out but then i hit a moment where i cut a scene where i was like that's it that is the tone and the vibe and then after that i was cutting 20 minutes a week for like four weeks and then we had an 80 minute film and it's just like yes this is it like this is we have a lot of work to do and we can focus things in and we can hone moments and hone narratives and but this is the clay on the table this is what we have to work with and so you're looking for that emotional heart of the film which is sounds like the same thing with writing narrative you're looking for the thing that gets you excited and you're looking for the emotional doorway and once you get through everything starts to make sense yeah and everything starts to flow and so for me it's like finding that in the form of a scene if i can cut a scene that has the right tone i can do 20 25 minutes a week just because i know the identity of the film and one of the directors for the, you, for you the can, cowboy doc you can cut 25 minutes of the piece a week yeah Wow, <laughs> that's quite a because bit. Because I know, I know the footage. Like I know the footage so well at that point. I know what it wants to be. Like it's like finally, I know what you want to be, and I can yeah. go. And obviously, that's not f- like final cut. We have a lot of dialing in and a lot of finessing to do. Sure, it's just like I know what you, I know what you want to be. I know what you're telling me. Let's go. And one of the directors of the Cowboy Doc described it as I was sending these 20 minute chunks. He was just like it feels like there's a huge ship in the night in the fog and it's slowly coming into focus like it is already a thing it is already a film we are just discovering the identity and the vibe of the film and so it's like slowly moving at you and it's just coming into view and it's just like yes this is what you've wanted to be yeah how long from when you got the footage to where you started to see the shape taking place of that ship how how long was the gap there that you were just sort of going through the footage and, and trying to find that heart? Uh, like a month, maybe four to six weeks. And that was broken up by like loading the footage, practicing everything, you know, just, just some like housekeeping things, but mostly just watching the footage and concepting. And I do a big note card deal. And so putting things on note cards, ideas on note cards, I have like what I call my note card bullpen. I just put all these ideas that stuck out to me on, I have a huge chalkboard. And so I put them all on like one end of the chalkboard and like, here's all of my beats and things that I could cut scenes around. And then I can like step back and start to put note cards around and place them here and there and like move huge sections of the film around before I've even cut and kind of start to feel the vibe and feel the momentum and emotion of the film. And so that's like, you know, four, Four, six weeks of work before I feel like I'm starting to see what it wants to be. Is that as frustrating and <laughs> like just that lack of uh, confidence you first have when you're first starting a cut of a narrative? Is it like that same sort of thing? Or, or like when I'm yeah. first writing a piece or developing a piece, it's just, it's all kind of in shambles and you're not seeing the shape yeah. like, you, like you said. So at first it's just stress and it's just, oh, yeah. this is terrible. I'm never going to totally. be able to do this. Totally. I mean, it's just like, I've fooled everybody. <laughs> they gave me money for this. <laughs> the, uh, this is when they realize. Yeah. I mean, you're like stumbling around in the dark and you're just like grabbing a thing and it's just like i think this is a tail and you're just like nope that's not a tail that's a vine or it's just like you're <laughs> oh, just fine good yeah <laughs> <laughs> i knew you were gonna i knew you <laughs> anyway anyway I'm so you're stumbling around in the dark <laughs> oh god uh where was I? Yes, dark tales. Uh, <laughs> you're you're like grasping for anything that could be the film. Yeah, and I and I mean, and it may feel I've never really written anything narrative. Like I've written some short stories and some things like that, but nothing with the intent of showing people and or like a film. And so, 
you know, I don't know the emotional roller coaster that is that, but it feels very similar and it feels emotionally the same. But with documentary, and you can speak to this, but with documentary, for me, I honestly feel like I'm discovering the film. Yeah. And then when this film is made and I step back and I look at the edit, even if it's a rough cut or something, it just does not feel like I did it. It's like, where did this come from? Like it emerged from this pile of footage and here it is. And yeah, now just, what do I do? It just all of a sudden exists. Like I have two kids now and I mean, not to relate filmmaking to my children because I mean, my children are the greatest things ever, uh, but so is filmmaking. So, Hey, but. sure. Why not? <laughs> but it's kind of like you made them, but it's kind of like you didn't. And it's just like, yeah. poof, they're here. And you're like, Whoa, you're, you're here. You weren't. And now you are. Yeah, totally. And, uh, I had nothing to do with that. You just all of a sudden exist and always have somehow. Yeah. And it's kind of sort of, I mean, I didn't do that much, obviously my my wife did all the, the work, but still, the point is, totally. I was involved, okay? Um, <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I was there. Um, but yeah. yeah, like with developing a story or trying to break a story from nothing, there's nothing at first. There's some kind of current. Sometimes there's just been like a tone that I know I wanted to hit. Like yep. there's this feeling totally. that I knew I wanted totally. to give an audience. And I wasn't even sure why. Like I didn't know what I was trying to say with that tone or whatever. It just started with this, this feeling. Yep. And then it became, oh, oh, that this fits that feeling actually maybe it's this and then and then it just snowballs and then oh it's not that it's this and here's why and then all of a sudden it just becomes something and and i think the most interesting and the most i can relate to what you said is when there is a concept already and you're trying to break it of okay well what happens here what you know what's the arc what causes the arc what's going on with her and why does she go to this point and then all of a sudden just these lightning strikes of like oh it's this of course it's this because of this and then yeah and then, like i said the theme really really lands hard for you and you figure out the philosophy of the film and what, what you're really trying to say. And then all of a sudden, oh, it's course of this. Of course it's, a, and it's like, which I've talked about on the show before, but it's like the film starts to reveal itself to you, not you totally. making it up. Although, I mean, you're making it up. It's not this mystical, magical thing. It sounds a little pretentious maybe, but it does feel very much like it's all of a sudden just revealing itself to you that you're not the one yeah. coming up with these ideas. You're just realizing them. Yeah. And I think that's, but that's one of the things in documentary is you literally are discovering yeah. like you're not making up what's happening on screen. Like you can put these things in juxtaposition to each other to create a new emotion. It's like one plus one equals three all the time in documentaries and you're holding on a look or you're holding on a tone or you're holding on a moment in order to communicate something. But at the same time, it's like you didn't write and you didn't put these things in place necessarily during production. And so you are discovering. Yeah. Like yeah. you are literally discovering the film and the footage. That's so interesting. And and it sounds like such a great way to like work out a different narrative muscle. Yeah, totally. Well, it helps so much with narrative fiction work as well. Yeah. There's like a big crossover mentally there because you can become more than a button pusher as an editor, you can become more than just an editor in this moment doing this thing. If you flexed that narrative muscle and you flexed the tone and the pace of narrative, like you become so much more invaluable to a narrative director because they can bounce ideas off of you and they can bounce thoughts and pacing and all of these other things off of you. And so you become so much more instrumental to the process, to the post-process in narrative work when you've done documentary work. And I think it's easier to transition from doc to narrative rather than narrative to doc, because if you're a pure narrative editor and then all of this footage is dumped on your lamp blah, lamp, and <laughs> someone is just like, find the story. And it's just like, well, isn't that your job? No, this is documentary work is your job. Yeah. Yeah. And it, just, it seems to me that it would be such a great education in storytelling because you're like dissecting real life stories and honest moments. Yeah. That would be such a great, like feels like it would just be such a great education for when you are writing those fictional narratives mm -hmm. to sort of bake in more of that realism and more of that emotional truth yeah, that we're yeah, all yeah, constantly hunting for and you know trying to find yep. so it, that stuff is so difficult and in narrative and it's and it's so it's such an odd thing too because you know you desperately want that emotional truth like that's the that's the golden trophy. That's the, yeah. you know, that's the thing that you want. It's like, if you can, if you can land that emotional truth, you're really, you're not going to be landing the film with your audience, but it's like, sure. you don't really know if you have it or not because you're the one that's no. doing it. And then, you know,
know, your cast and the execution of it is going to heavily weigh in on, you know, uh, landing on that emotional truth or not. And then even in the end with the edit and the music and yeah. how you choose to pace that moment, like it's so exactly. strange, but it's like, it, you know, you have to tee up to hit, you know, a hole in one from square one. For sure. But it matters For all sure. the way through. Yeah, exactly. There's a there's a short that I'm working on now. It's like 30 minutes, so it's not feature. But I put so much thought and so much energy into these setups and payoff, like throughout the entire film, like setup, payoff, setup, payoff, and then everything culminates yes. at the end. So there's like these two threads that are running. It's like the present day thread of these dramatic things that are happening, and then it's the backstory. And so it's like these two threads, and I'm bumping between the origin backstory and then the present day story and then just as you get kind of really really invested in the present day story i bump you back to get more context about the end but then these two threads that are like intertwining as you're following them towards the end the conclusion you realize that these two threads are connected and it's actually just been one thread and so then that starts to come to life and you're like i understand that only by this history and only by this past could this person have possibly had this response to this moment and like that is super exciting and like super fun to concept. And I remember kind of pitching that structure idea to the director and just being like, I think we have something that is pretty special and like we could do something like this. And it's kind of terrifying because you're putting it out into the universe and it's like, I'm going to try this. And then you just don't know if it's going to work, but you get to the end yeah. and it has that effect on people and you're like, Oh, it worked. <laughs> Success. It sounds kind of like like doc work is kind of like a great, you know, doc editing is a great skill for any editor to have because yeah, it just seems like it causes you to think in a different way that's extremely useful when, you know, maybe when you have problematic footage, when you get into a cut that it's like it's not all there in the footage and you kind of have, you know, reinvent some things to make it work, yeah. which happens with Absolutely. literally everything. Yep. I even know of stories from behind the scenes of mega, mega films that you would never think had those moments, but absolutely had those moments where they were fixing mm -hmm. scenes that they just didn't get on the day. For sure. So For do sure. you do you think that doc work and that structure and the way that you have to find something out of nothing, do you think that has really helped you? Because there was definitely moments in Ballistic where, where we had that yeah. situation where we were finding things that weren't quite there and, and fixing things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it totally helps with narrative work just because you have that muscle and you have the ability to speak into it more intelligently and more emotionally. But also, you know how to set a tone and you know how to set an emotion, which you have to do kind of right out of the gate with doc work because you might not have the best audio. You might not have the best lighting. You might not have the most dramatic shot, right? But you still have to set a cinematic tone. Yeah. And so having the ability to set that tone, like we need this feeling in this moment. I can do that because I've done it in doc work. You know what I mean? We need to feel tense here. I know what to do. We need to feel excited here. I know what to do. And so you know all of the tools in your arsenal to create an emotion, which is one of the most, I think one of the most difficult and fun things to do as an editor is to just, like I was saying before, it's like one plus one equals three. It's like, how do you know that this plus this is going to be tense? This plus this is going to be sad. And with Doc, it's like, it's all about emotion. It's all about tone because you know, you're not necessarily caring about continuity. There's more jump cuts in doc work because there could just be one camera and you need to get to this moment to this moment. Well, what's going to yeah. work? Why does this cut work? Because it's the motivation of the movement within the frame or it's the motivation of the camera. So then if you come to a problem scene in a, in a narrative, it's like, well, we can get around this because we're not beholden to pure linear movement. Like we can watch, we can get a little loose and it will still hit that emotion. Why? Because humans don't care about that as much. And so as we're watching something, as we do about the emotion, and so you cut for emotion and then you fix your continuity issues later. Uh, and sometimes you don't even need to fix continuity issues. So there's like all of these things you pick up from the doc world that you can instantly apply to the narrative world. And it makes you a way better editor when someone says, because I like to keep directors high level as long as I can, especially in doc work, but also in narrative. It's like, tell me what you want this to feel like. Yeah. If you give me an emotion, I can do that. If we're not on the same page right out of the gate, it's like, well, it feels a little apathetic and I need it to feel a little more motivated. I know exactly what to do. Do you work with doc directors 
versus narrative directors entirely differently? Is there some crossover there? Like, what's the difference between those two relationships? I think for doc directors, I mean, it depends on the story and it depends on the film. But for doc directors, I think a lot of times they're looking to me to set a little bit more of the tone and be like, what is this scene about? And like, what is this moment? And how does this scene or this act point to the larger emotion and the larger story that I want to tell? Whereas in narrative work, it feels like the director is like, I wrote this or the writer director or the director who's worked with the writer. We wrote this. This is because of X, Y, and Z. That's why this scene comes before this scene. In doc work, that's basically my call. If we put this scene in front of this scene, we're going to achieve this. You know what I mean? So it's like the foundation is a little bit different, but the point of the tree that you get to as you're climbing, like they start to converge and they start to merge because it's at the end of the day, it's just storytelling. And you're just trying to convey an emotion and a narrative to the audience. And so you're going to use a lot of the same tools and you're going to use a lot of the same methods to get there at a certain point. But it's like the pyramids. I mean, it's like, Doc, you start big and you go small and narrative, you start small and you go big. That's really interesting. So would you say toward the end of the process is when they st- sort of start to like yeah, definitely become the same thing? Because now you have yeah. you, the, the scripts there yeah. and a Doc toward the end. Totally. And and like, especially when they're in the, the moment that like directors, producers, directors are in the room cutting doc versus narrative it feels very similar because you're just you're dialing in frames in the doc world and you're dialing in frames in the narrative world you're rethinking the emotional heart of this scene do we need it to be stronger or do we need it to be a little bit more subdued and so you're really talking about the same things in the narrative world as the doc world it's just the beginnings and how you got to this point are dramatically different. What What would you say, do you have any like instances of, I mean, obviously you could be vague, but like good and bad for, for a doc director out there and a narrative director, just ways that they've communicated things to you that were good or bad? Like what was most useful? What was, you know, the least useful? Yeah. I mean, speaking more so to Doc, I suppose, but it could be, we'll just say Doc. When a director comes in and they have such a preconceived notion and idea of what the story is, is not a good place to start. It's like, this is what the film is. And it's like, how do you even know that? Like, how could you possibly even say that right now? And so when that happens, it becomes a little bit difficult. I try to not work with people that know the film before they've written it honestly. Yeah. But what I love, and this is in doc and narrative, uh, but definitely in doc world, this is the tone that I think we need to set here. This is the emotion I want the audience to feel at this moment. You know what I mean? Like that's a great note for me because I love to, a lot of times in doc world, I'm developing the emotional heart and the emotional tone of this moment. And then I'm cutting at that. But if I'm a little bit off base or if I'm way off base, if I'm off base on what I thought the emotional tone needed to be for this moment, rather than saying, so I think if we move this shot to here and this shot to here, this shot to here, it'll fix it. I'll be like, well, what are you trying to achieve? Well, I want it to feel like there's more at stake. That I can do. So it's kind of like talking to a composer, really, because you're not going to tell a composer, be like, you know, instead of that being in D, we should do E. You know (laughs) know what I mean? Yeah, right, right, right. right. Can we go for staccato there instead? Like, you know, I I always talk to Daniel in, you know, the emotion that it should feel like a monster, you know, is approaching. Right. Totally. That's cool. I like that in Doc world Mm. yeah so that so that's way more useful to you than any kind of like technical talks yeah for sure because you know in the narrative world the director presumably knows the story inside it out whether they wrote it or they have been like sitting with it for two years you know what i mean having copious amounts of meetings about it before production like they know the story inside and out in the dark world i know the story inside and out even though we've had conversations and even though we've talked about and they've instilled in me their heart, their passion and what they feel could be a way through the film. Like I'm, I'm, I'm writing it. I'm putting pen to paper a lot of times and developing 
the executable plan for that. I've seen all the footage and like they haven't a lot of times, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of like a director working with a writer very much then because, you know, you have the exactly. writer doing all totally. the work and it's like, well, you know, I've, I've been working with writers for the first time ever recently. And sometimes, you know, it's, you know, sometimes I'm like, Hey, I think this is how the moment should go. This happens and this yep. happens and this happens and here's why this happens. And then she realizes this, but sometimes it's like, you know, I want her to be more, you know, take more of a stronger stance here. You know, this is a moment yep. where she needs to be defeated and we need to feel like all is lost at, at this moment here. Yep. Can we do that? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> you know? Can you, please? Yeah, no, for sure. And a lot of doc editor, not a lot, but it's becoming more prevalent to where doc editors are getting writing credit on that film. And so they do sit in that writer's seat a lot more in doc world and the director's chair and the editor's chair. I mean, documentary is really the editor's playground. In a lot of ways, I think, and maybe I've just been fortunate to hook up with the right directors for the right projects, yeah. but it's a completely different scope of work. It's a completely different job description when you shift from narrative editing to documentary editing. Yeah, and it's just... It's, which is fun. Yeah, it's it seems so unique in comparison to my experience in the narrative world and just a really interesting process of there is no script and then in the end there is a script. You know, like yeah. just a total reversal of how... I'm used to creating a story, which is really interesting. But if anybody's listening now and they're wanting to get started in the doc world as an editor, was there like something that helped you in the beginning to cut your teeth on this world or were you just thrown into it? Or was there something that like got you started to sort of prep you for you yeah. know, the intensity of <laughs> you right. know, a doc edit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... I guess like really practically, you just need to cut and you just need footage to cut. And like we were saying earlier, depending on the story, depending on the scope, depending on the subject matter, it can be so much easier to shoot a doc. And there's a, there's just a ton of experimental docs. And so for me personally, like years ago, I would shoot my own footage and do these little three, five, 10 minute docs where I would follow around like a guitar maker and shoot the process. And then I would challenge myself to not make it feel like a process video and make it feel like a verite doc, like something where we're discovering as the audience what it's like to be a guitar maker or yeah. things like that. And, so, and you need extremely minimal gear. Like you could totally shoot a doc on your iPhone, just grabbing and going and like finding an interesting subject and following them around for a day and then get in there and see like what you can do, what you can push. Don't be beholden to narrative flow, narrative structure, don't be linear in your thought process, like push it, you know? And so, I mean, you need, that's always the difficult thing with an editor and cutting your teeth as an editor is you need footage to edit, to be an editor. And so there's a barrier of entry there. If you can find somebody who's shooting interesting things, or you yourself can go shoot something with any camera, more so in the doc world, because I mean, docs, especially in the last three to five years have really stepped up in the cinematic approach as far as cameras and there's a lot more cinematic in a lot of ways yeah for just sure because it's become more uh, accessible and so there's definitely a genre of documentary that's extremely cinematic and extremely epic but then there's a genre of doc that is not at all and it does not literally everybody says this about narrative work but it's even more so for like it literally doesn't matter what you shoot it with and you just start cutting yeah, yeah. I think there's so much forgiveness there because it's reality and we expect a different thing. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a great point that if if you wanted to get into doc, that's that's such an easier end to anything else. Because like you said, you could just take your phone and I'm sure there's a ton of local interesting businesses or people For sure. that would love to have a free piece on them that they could just toss online or whatever. Totally. So you could go, I'm sure you could go get access and subjects just for free, just by asking. And if you just open yourself up to interesting stories. I mean, that's the, the mindset has to be there where you're like, today I'm going to find an interesting story. And you just keep your mind and ears open for interesting conversations. Like, oh, I met this person at the coffee shop and they have a, you know, crazy da 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 da. Yeah. And you're like, okay, what coffee shop was that? And you go there and you try and find, you know, there are crazy stories everywhere that you can kind of chase down. 
and just start cutting. For sure. Booth is a great example of that. Yeah, exactly. That's just not me. Like, I'm not that guy that can go and hunt down those stories and then just create a thing out of nowhere. Like, but Booth does that all day long, just talking totally. to everybody and finding these, like, really fascinating, beautiful For sure. human stories and just randomly making this amazing thing out of it. Yeah. He has a couple online like that. Uh, I just love and respect that so much that he does that. But that's such a simple, free thing to do. For sure. And that's the thing about documentary is there's so many genres of doc work. And so you can cue in on a specific character and do like a character driven doc, or you can do an event driven doc. Like I saw this, I follow this Instagram account and I I don't even remember the name. It's this photographer. She's in Thailand and she went to this event where all of these people gather and they basically let, from what I gathered and read off of her Instagram stories was she, basically you go there and you let the spirit of your tattoos take over your body. And it just looked like there was crazy shit happening, like crazy. And it was outside these amazing, huge, like religious icons and structures and statues and all of this stuff. And it just was super interesting to me. And so I just like, She hasn't responded, but shot her a message and been like, yo, I think this could be a super fascinating short documentary. How much footage did you shoot? I would love to cut something. And it doesn't matter if she just shot on her phone. It doesn't matter if she shot it vertically. It doesn't matter if there's also photos in there. So you don't have to have a character follow doc or a character driven doc. You can have like an event driven doc or a moment driven doc or a, I mean, you can get super, go out and shoot a bunch of random footage and then find someone who's a poet to like record a voiceover that speaks to, I mean, it's endless. It doesn't matter. With a doc like that, like the one that you were talking about that you want to cut, do you think it would be something where you would want to grab interviews or do you think you would just no. like find something from what's already there? Yeah, totally. Just here it is. And you just start showing it. And the footage kind of pulls you into the moment and you're like, what is going on here? And then things like it starts to trickle out. And I mean, the challenge with that one would be to at what point do you distill enough information so that the mystery doesn't turn to confusion? I mean, I, personally, what I think I would do in that situation would be like some really simple but effective like supers title cards that say one sentence, two sentence to kind of give a little context to what we're seeing rather than interviews to kind of keep it mysterious and to keep it aloof and to keep it distant from us as the viewer. But it's just, I've never seen people do what these people are doing. What is going on here? And it's just fascinating to watch that. And you don't even need all the context. You don't need the history. You don't need the understanding culturally of what's going on to be like, this is super interesting and I want to watch five minutes of this. Yeah, definitely. So I guess like the main takeaway is just do it. (laughs) Just go do it. Yeah, totally. And there's a ton of things online, like archival footage. I mean, a film that changed my life and I mean, recently was Apollo 11. I mean, that is going to go down in my life as such an instrumental film. I like, I loved that so much, but it was just all of this archival NASA footage. And yes, it was not scanned and it wasn't publicly available, but there's tons of things online that have a ton of archival and public domain footage that you, that is a form of documentary, you know, yeah. you can just go download that and start putting stuff together. Yeah. You've even cut some stuff just for fun from archival footage, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 I love it. That's why I loved Apollo 11. Oh, it was so good. Yeah. I haven't seen that one yet. I'm going to have to see that. It's so good. So, I would I would end this by saying, you know, what advice do you have? But I think we've already given that now at this yeah, point. Totally. Just cut it. But what's next that you have? I mean, the Cowboy Doc, is there anything about that coming out soon or any of the other ones that are coming out anytime soon? Or is that a bunch of stuff you can't really talk about just yet? Yeah, it's a quite a bit of stuff I can't really talk about yet, either from like legally not being able to talk about it or just I don't know. Like the Cowboy Doc, I'm assuming is likely going to come out this year, probably in the next three to six months. And then there's some series that are kind of in development, some doc series that are in development mode right now, basically looking for the ability to make like the stories are there. And that's the thing with doc work. It's like the stories are there, you know, you just have to go capture them. And so there's like a handful of things that are in development, some things that have been shot that I'm putting together, stuff like that. That's kind of all. (laughs) (laughs) That's That's awesome. Well, we'll put, I'll get links for you from stuff and we'll put definitely everything we can on the page so people can definitely check it out but thanks man and uh this is the second time i've had you on Mm. and i'm sure there'll be a third time relatively soon good good (laughs) 
Okay, bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> and that's it for today. If you want to connect with Lucas online, go to filmriot.com forward slash podcast. Find the episode page for this episode, and you'll find links to connect with Lucas, including other works that he has done. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Connolly. And I'll see you next time. Until then, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. <laughs>